SYS presents Adventures in Online Education. Welcome, friends. You're listening to SYS Presents Adventures in Online Education. I'm your host, Natalie Conway. Thanks for being here. If you're new to the podcast, welcome. I am so glad that you are here. If you like not only listening to podcasts, but reading and thinking about education, you're going to want to head over to aoepodcast.org and enter your info at the bottom of the page to start receiving the AOE newsletter. It's a short weekly write-up that will get you thinking about your own teaching practice and the ideas from the show that week. Returning listeners, welcome back. I appreciate you very much. Let's get to it. On today's episode of Adventures in Online Education, I have the pleasure of speaking with my fellow educator and good friend, Maddie Dahl. Maddie has been teaching online for eight years. During her tenure, she has taught a wide range of classes from basic high school writing and grammar to AP English courses. When she isn't teaching, you can usually find her playing board games or exploring Oregon. She's going to teach us the ins and outs of online AP classes today. Her insights are invaluable. So, are you ready? Let's learn something new. Maddie Dahl, welcome back to the podcast. I'm so glad you're here again. It's really exciting to be here again. I love talking with you about anything related to high school, really. But before we dive into AP and all that goes with that, you have some exciting news for, I guess, next school year. You want to tell our audience what's happening in the life of Maddie Dahl? I'm getting married at the beginning of next school year, which is uh, kind of a hectic time to do it, but it's our favorite season, so excited to have a nice pumpkin-themed wedding. That is awesome. Congratulations. woo Thank you. We're very excited for you. Fall weddings are lovely, too, so that's just going to be awesome. Have you picked out a dress yet? My mother-in-law is actually making my dress. Awesome. Awesome. We're doing a a lot of DIY stuff and having a lot of friends help out with different aspects. So hopefully it'll all go off without a hitch. I bet it will. That sounds super cool. I love it. Well, let me know if there's anything I can do. (laughs) Oh, I will. (laughs) (laughs) I'll start sewing something. As long as it has straight lines, I'm good. Perfect. Yeah. (laughs) I got to make sure that I'm not scheduling myself to have a bunch of things due the Friday before so I don't get too behind on all of my grading. (laughs) There you go. Ms. Dahl students, next fall, light September for you. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. Speaking of your students and your classes, you are an experienced AP teacher. And though we know high school is experienced differently for our various students, for some, it's a marathon slog to just acquire credits. For others, they're sprinting to graduation. We create different online courses and different paths to accommodate the needs of all of those various learners. You've been teaching high school AP English classes for a while now. What exactly does that look like online? How does that work? So I've taught both AP Language and Composition and AP Literature and Composition online for a total of five years now. And AP courses are actually pretty similar online as they are in brick and mortar schools. So we have to go through the same steps to have our AP courses approved by College Board. I had to write a syllabus that met the College Board requirements for my course and submit it for review and approval, just like you would for any other AP course. Some AP online courses come from large companies and they're built to be asynchronous. But I personally could never run an asynchronous AP class because I believe that one of the greatest resources in my AP class is the ability for my students to learn from and interact with each other. And so for that reason, I have a lot of synchronous live lessons along with asynchronous work. That makes so much sense to me because the synchronous time that you are online with your students is really important for both you And the students, no matter what level you're teaching, kindergarten through high school, but especially for an AP class, like you just said, can you speak more about the importance of that and what you use that time for? 
Yeah. So I see benefit in having both synchronous and asynchronous work. You often would send students home with homework, especially in an AP class. And that's kind of what I focus my asynchronous time on. But the synchronous sessions allow students to collaborate with each other and bounce ideas off of their peers more. And one major benefit of my online AP class is the flexibility of student schedules which allows them to schedule a lot of one-on-one sessions with me if they aren't understanding a concept or if they need additional help with an assignment. And this really makes it easy for me as a teacher to make sure I'm meeting all of my students where they're at and helping them make meaningful learning gains in the AP class. So I do this for students in all of my classes. I often reach out for one-on-ones to help students that are struggling, but my students in my AP class are experts at reaching out for help and advocating for their learning. As far as our live sessions go and frequency, we meet in live sessions three days a week for an hour each on Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. And in addition, students have two days of just asynchronous work. So my classes are structured using flipped classroom model. Basically, Mondays, students start their day with a 10-minute weekly starter video that goes over what we're doing for the rest of the week, and then they come to my Monday class at 1 p.m. prepared to work. That sounds really cool. For listeners who aren't familiar with the flipped class model, one, we have an episode on it, so please refer back to that if you're interested to learn more. But Maddie, could you just give us the gist? What is the flipped class model? And why use it? What does that really look like in your classroom? So basically, like I said, we have a weekly starter video every Monday that students are expected to watch before attending our live class at 1 p.m. And for most of my classes, if I have a weekly starter video, I don't have a class that same day, but AP is special. (laughs) That video really covers everything that we're working on for the week, gives a brief overview, and then it's kind of the lecture time for my structured lessons. So usually for my AP class, it's a five to 10 minute lecture and some overviews of assignments and uh, what to do to prepare to come to class on Monday. And then once we get into class on Monday, it's usually focused on a reading or a discussion or working on class note taking. And occasionally we use this session to do a practice AP test, multiple choice question set, or something like that. And a lot of times this class is just structured as more of a group work time because it is on the same day that we do our flipped classroom video. And so if students have a major essay or project due that week, they will often use that time to work on that. Then this leads into my Tuesday and Thursday classes where the majority of my structured lessons occur. I like using that Monday time for online discussions a lot of the time, though, because it really allows for more shy students to participate. And I try to use a hybrid model for that discussion of both typing responses and speaking on the mic, which works pretty well. I give students usually a set of Google Slides with discussion questions on them where they can write their answers for five minutes to start at the beginning of class on that Monday. And then they'll spend a lot of that time either discussing what they wrote or expanding on what another student has written or commenting on posts that they agree with or disagree with. And that way, everyone gets to participate in some fashion, even if they aren't on the mic chatting. I like that. That's really honoring your diverse learners and also universally designing your instruction so that even if a kiddo isn't comfortable using the mic or maybe isn't quick enough in the chat, they have that opportunity to still participate and engage. So that's really cool. Tell me more. I mean, like I said, we really want them to be focusing on collaborating. This is why I use both synchronous and asynchronous models. As we move forward through the week, a lot of times we'll focus on our other classes with really overviewing a concept or using class time to work on their AP lit skills. There's a long list of skills that each AP class is expected to teach. And we also do a lot of writing in our class. So peer editing a lot of times will take place during those Tuesday or Thursday classes. But a big benefit of teaching online AP courses is that I can open up assignments ahead of time even. So I open up all of my assignments for the week on Monday so students can look ahead and see what they need to be completing for the week. If they have a planned vacation or a doctor's appointment that they're going to be missing class for, they can work ahead so they don't come back behind. But also the whole class lives in Canvas, which is great. This same thing can be used for Google Classroom. So students can review everything super easily too, and is also great for an unexpected absence. 
I am a big believer in the idea of practicing writing in live sessions so students can get a feel for what that writing will look on an AP test. So for example, on the AP test for AP Lit, they have to write three essays. They have two hours to do so. So that's essentially 40 minutes an essay. So every two to three weeks, we have a timed writing assignment where they are given 40 minutes to compose an essay basically on what we've been reading or whatever unit we're currently in. And then they turn that into our Canvas page. But then for the last 20 minutes of class after they've submitted, I like to have them swap essays, read what other students wrote, and see how other students have answered the prompt. And that way they can discuss with each other and provide feedback and at the same time build on their own writing skills so they can really come back the next time and write even stronger. That is really cool. I love when students are talking to students and kids are learning from kids. Something that is just striking me as you speak is how you use and pair synchronous and asynchronous activities in such a way that you're really helping kids with executive functioning and organizing. When you give them time to work on an essay in class or to peer edit in class, you're letting them know this is time that you should dedicate to this now. And that is sometimes a decision they wouldn't be able to successfully make on their own at home. And so that is really cool that you're supporting them in that way as well. It just seems like a really neat byproduct. And then the way you're practicing for the AP test is really meaningful. And it's very different from just rote taking a practice test and seeing how you did, because you're really using it as a formative assessment What other formative assessment tools do you use in your AP classes to help support your students' learning? So uh, I mentioned the timed rights. We often will use these as kind of rough drafts for more formal essays, which is great because then they aren't so bogged down in the, like, I totally didn't write enough on my timed right. They get a chance to expand upon that for more points because, as we know, all AP students are the ones that really, really care about every last point. but. Other than the writing assignments, we read a lot of books. We read a lot of the same books that standard AP Lit and Comp teachers have in their classes, like Wuthering Heights and Frankenstein, because the online structure allows us to keep a lot of class notes. We use Google Docs constantly, so they will be taking notes in Google Docs or Google Slides even and kind of have a running doc as a classroom, or I will assign more structured notes that they can work on together. And this allows for those students who are really struggling with the reading to kind of get a little bit of a hint from the other students on what they should be focusing on. And I can also be using the changes tool, the see new changes in Google to track who's writing. And then I can really see who's participating and who's not, who's really getting it, and who's maybe struggling. And they don't necessarily know how to use that as well as I do. So tracking comments and changes has become my best friend as a teacher. That's awesome. I also think a lot of people feel like online classes prevent collaboration, but I fully disagree with this because I have seen some of the best collaboration with students online that I've seen as a teacher. My final project in AP every year is one that I adapted from a project that our 10th grade English teacher, Wade Anderson, designed for his younger students. He designed a project where his students could design their own dystopian fiction government. And I added a bit of AP elements to it, made it more research focused, and of course, added AP appropriate books as the basis. So this project has students choose from some classic dystopian literature like 1984 or Brave New World or Handmaid's Tale. And they read that in groups. They come up with their own reading schedule. At this point, they're experts at kind of timing because it's our last project of the year. So they develop a reading schedule. They develop when their notes assignments will be due. They develop when they will need to get all of their prep work done. And then they work on, quote, fixing the government in the books that they're writing, (laughs) reading about. And essentially, they need to respond to how the characters are able to circumvent and oppose the government in the books, which is really fun as a teacher to grade. Right. (laughs) They work in Zoom breakout rooms uh, and use Google Hangouts to plan and build their projects. And then they end up making a Google website where they essentially advertise their government. And they also have to write a collaborative essay, which is super fun to watch them navigate. Basically, three people have to work together to write one cohesive essay. 
So it's easy to see why this is my favorite project. It sounds super fun and really complex. And you're asking students to synthesize so much and to collaborate and to be creative. It's like all of those 21st century skills melded into one really fun, I'm assuming, project. Have you ever had any students come up with pretty brilliant solutions to maybe problems we're experiencing in the real world as well? Not necessarily real world problems because they are really focused on analyzing the literature that they're reading. However, I did have one group last year come up with kind of a BBC radio broadcast that would pop up on every page that you navigated to. So it felt like there was like breaking news happening, which was not within the project scope, but they felt that it was really, it kind of jived with what they were looking at in 1984 where each time you clicked on a different page, you would have a news broadcaster that a lot of times would contradict himself and say, some people have said that I've said this on my last broadcast, but that's patently false to kind of show the ways that the government is ever shifting in that novel. Maddie, that sounds awesome. We're going to have a free resource in the show notes for teachers who do want to dive into the AP online world, a one-pager that kind of gives you a how-to of everything we've talked about so far. The other part of AP courses sometimes is that students are allowed to simultaneously earn college credits while they're in high school taking these courses. And I know you've created courses of that nature. What colleges does your school partner with now? And how does that all work? Who designs the course? Is it synchronous or asynchronous? What curriculum do you use? Are students part-time college students, or is it still a full-time high school thing? Can you kind of unwrap that for us? Yeah, sure. In Oregon, high school teachers who have a master's degree can partner with community colleges to do what's called College Credit Now courses. So I taught Writing 121 in the past at Frontier Charter Academy through Chemeketa Community College because that's our community college closest to our school district. And like AP, we, the teacher, design the syllabus and submit it for review to the college meeting the standards that they have set forth for that class. And Chemeketa has specific assignments that they expect each student taking Writing 121 at their school to complete, which in this case was an annotated bibliography. And each teacher is expected to design a course that reflects the goals that Chemeketa set forth for their students to make sure that they are meeting the college requirements. So students who take these College Now courses are full-time high school students who receive college credit. Just by completing the class and passing the class and meeting those standards, they are receiving college credit. It is different if students are fully ready to commit to taking just college classes. Frontier Charter actually allows our students to enroll in any class at their local community college, and our school will pay for it. So they can receive both high school and college credits at the same time. But usually those students also sign up for elective classes and take homeroom classes through our school. So they still have a connection with their high school peers. We really want to make sure that students are learning where they're at. So if a student is fully ready for college, we're not going to force them to take high school level classes that they might be bored in. However, AP is a great in-between for those students who need a challenge but aren't let's say, emotionally or academically ready for college classes. Many colleges have resources to help struggling students, but I know in my experience as a college student, I didn't know how to access those resources. It wasn't until I was a senior that I actually knew how to find the writing center at my college. So with AP classes, I see and talk to my students every day. I'm constantly monitoring their grades. I notice when they're struggling. So I, as a teacher, am able to reach out to those students. But again, if students are really great advocates for themselves, they feel like they have a maturity level where they can be an active participant in a college class setting, we are not going to hold those students back and force them to take just high school level credits. It's just like what we talked about at the start of the episode, where some kids are struggling to acquire credits and others are, it seems like they're just hanging out, right, (laughs) waiting to graduate. And so 
I think that's fantastic that your school offers that variety and that you can read kids and talk with them about those choices too and really differentiate between the AP course and a college credit now course. Those are important distinctions. And again, it's those other skills, those executive functioning and organization and planning skills and being able to find resources. A lot of that kids struggle freshman year in college because of those things that might hinder them from even graduating sometimes so that you get the opportunity to hold their hand or at least walk next to them while they're dipping their toe sort of into these courses or into this higher level classwork. I think that's really, really valuable. And that's not to say that the AP class is easier than the college class. The AP class is quite a bit of work. It is difficult content. It is college level content. It is just that there is that constant teacher support. I know that this is a high school student taking a college class. So I am equipped and other AP teachers are equipped with those skills of knowing how to meet those high school students where they're at. Absolutely. And that's fantastic. I mean, they're still developmentally the age they are, where they're at. So that's really cool to recognize them as the talented learners they are, but also as just the humans and the the kids that they are too. This is fantastic. After the break, we're going to talk a little bit more about your advice to educators who might be interested in doing what you're doing. So stick with us. What's the one thing all online schools and programs struggle with? Student engagement and the ability to truly personalize interventions. How do we solve those problems? With the use of Admin Dash, a brand new Canvas LTI tool from SYS Education. Admin Dash allows online teachers to see a risk assessment score that proactively identifies students who may need more specialized attention or intervention and offers a communication log that provides an outlet for complete transparency among teachers, admin, students, and families. At just 99 cents per student per year and with no minimum price and no fees, you can't afford to not use Admin Dash. For more information about Admin Dash, contact sales at syseducation.org and start connecting proactively with your online learners. All right, welcome back. Maddie, I bet you can look back now. You've had the luxury of time and experience. You can see what you did well, what you want to change. I'm really curious if there's a teacher out there who wants to create an AP course for their online program and they're starting from scratch. What's your advice for them? What do they do? So there are seminars across the country that you can sign up for that teach you how to be an AP teacher. If you have been to one of these, awesome. If you haven't, they are a fantastic resource. A lot of it is geared toward brick and mortar schooling, but for those online teachers, you can definitely find some stuff that will work for your classes. My biggest advice for online specific courses is to use the online resources that College Board provides. So College Board really revamped so much of its platform during the pandemic to allow for student interfacing online. They had teachers from across the country record little mini five-minute lectures. They have had a bunch of essays loaded, practice sets, multiple choice tests, all kinds of things added into their online database that is totally usable for your online AP classroom. They've now moved to get students to register for the AP test. They need to log in to your specific AP online classroom, which is great. However, the interfacing for the student side of the AP Central is not super smooth. So I suggest linking those readings and those videos and those practice tests into your Google Classroom if you have that resource. That way you are able to make sure that students are navigating to the correct video because there are a lot of numbers involved in the video naming and it can get a little bogged down for students. However, if you are there navigating for them, it's really great to help you make sure that they are getting that really difficult concept and understanding all of those AP concepts that they need to be learning. Very cool. Sounds like you need to be working for College Board a little bit, (laughs) doing some Uh, consulting with them. It feels like that sometimes. (laughs) 
AP Central also has a bunch of suggested unit paths that you can take, which is great. They have a sample syllabus and a lot of sample lessons that you can kind of pull from, which is great for those who are just starting your AP journey. And I updated my course this year to include a lot of these resources, and students have benefited from the practice exams in particular greatly because you can kind of start off with, okay, we're going to do this 18 problem set and you have the entire hour to take it and then whittle it down. Okay, now you have 30 minutes to take it. Okay, now you have 18 minutes, which is the amount of time you will have in the actual setting. And it really allows for students to kind of get that practice and get used to, okay, these are the actual kinds of questions I will see on the exam. I am prepped for this. I am getting this practice in. And it really, really lets them feel prepared. That's awesome. 18 minutes gives me anxiety to think about, but you're preparing your students so well that they're going in fearless, I do hope. So that's pretty cool. We'll have links to these resources in the show notes as well for AP Central and College Board. Thank you so much, Maddie, for all of this information. It's been really encouraging. Often we speak about the struggles that students face in online education, and it's nice to change gears a bit and talk about the successes and the excitement and the tremendous growth that can happen in an online school as well. I like to end the episodes this season on a lighter note, less serious, but hopefully still inspirational, at the very least happy. (laughs) I'm asking my guests who their favorite teachers were as kids growing up, and I'm really curious who was yours as a kid and why. My favorite teacher would have to be my high school journalism teacher. I had her all four years of high school, Mrs. Rosh. She was my intro to journalism teacher freshman year, and then I was in newspaper and yearbook with her. She taught me all about how to write effectively, how to write succinctly, how to use correct grammar, all about the AP style guide. (laughs) Oh, boy. And she really gave us a lot of freedom in what we were doing and had a lot of trust for us as learners. She spent a lot of the beginning of the courses I was in with her front loading. And then it was kind of like, you have the skills, go make magic, which was a super fun thing as a high schooler to feel like I had power in what I was learning and what I was doing. And then to have a physical product at the end of the day, like a newspaper or a yearbook to reflect on, I did this, I contributed to this, was uh, really excellent. And Miss Rosh was great at fostering that learning. Thank you, Miss Rosh, because now Maddie's doing that awesome work with kids today, which is really cool. That's awesome. And to have a teacher for four years, that's wild. I love that. Yep. Did you go to a small high school or is it just how it happened? No, my high school is like 1,500 kids. I had 400 people in my graduating class. So it was kind of like she was the journalism teacher. She was the newspaper teacher. And so if that was what you were interested in, you had to have Miss Rosh. And good thing I liked her. <laughs> good thing indeed. Well, thank you, Miss Rosh. We appreciate you very much. Maddie, if listeners want to get in touch with you, maybe learn more about the work you do or just pick your brain about AP, how can they get in touch with you? They can reach out to me at my SYS email, M-D-A-H-L at syseducation.org. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. And thanks for sharing your time with me today. This was super fun. And it almost makes me want to go back and write essays in AP English. Maybe not 100%, but I'm inspired. I'll go pick up my journal at least after this episode. (laughs) You're always welcome to come do timed rights with me. Any to all right, just just to hone my skills a little, just a little challenge. I love it. <laughs> Thanks, Maddie. Thanks for having me. Have a great day. You too. Thanks for listening to this episode of SYS Presents Adventures in Online Education. Special thanks to my guest today, Maddie Dahl. Today we learned that AP and college credit classes can be executed really well in the online setting. We learned that collaboration and great use of synchronous class time can lead to students achieving at a high level. Thanks again for listening today. If you liked what you heard, please hit subscribe and give us a rating. On Twitter, you can follow me, Natalie Conway, at AoE Natalie, and the show at SYS Presents. 
If you're interested in finding out more about SYS Education, head to syseducation.org. This podcast wouldn't be possible without our exceptional team here at SYS Education, including our sound engineer, Natalie Farrell, and our producer, Bo Neal. Thanks for listening. And remember, we can learn new things.